Hi everyone, thanks for joining me and also thank you to the conference organisers for the invitation to talk. Today I'll be giving an initial summary of Phase 2 excavations recently undertaken at McGilligan Training Centre with funding from the National Lottery Heritage in collaboration with the Ministry of Defence and the Benevena and Coastal Lowlands Landscape Partnership from the 13th, 13th of September to the 8th of October this year. So we're just not that long finished actually. So why were we there? Well, the key purpose of the project was to connect the local community with their First World War heritage and landscape by generating increased levels of knowledge and awareness about the defence heritage resource within the McGilligan Training Estate. Um, this would in turn enable the interpretation of some of the extant remains of training for war within the camp and increase our understanding of the level of the recruits, of the life of the recruits and the training drills they encountered at the time. Also facilitating elements of landscape management for the Ministry of Defence and the HED, similar to that already in place at Valley Kindler. Previously working with the Minister of Defence's Major Canniford, a work was carried out in tandem with our investigations of Valley Kindler, during which time we also identified seemingly well-preserved fieldworks at McGilligan. These were characteristic of First World War practice trenches and found to be widely distributed throughout the McGilligan landscape. As you can see here on the, the screen, you can see that they're from one end of the estate basically to the other. Practice trenches were constructed to allow troops to train in trench warfare at every level, from platoon tactics to brigade scale manoeuvres, and to allow the troops to train in actual construction of trenches. Using aerial photographs and LIDAR data analysis, it was considered highly likely that the subsurface archaeological features would still survive in situ. Also, an MOD audit of the McGilligan Estate had identified certain areas of these relic trench systems to have been of health, elevated heritage value. In particular, a number of crenellated type trench, trenches sited in an area of flat grassland and plantation just northwest of the prison. The report recommended that these were further investigated in order to establish the full extent and character of the remains. And so this gave us our excavation location for phase one of the project. So similar to Bala Kindler, we know that the trench digging was taking place at McGilligan during or near to the latter period of the Second Boer War, possibly actually as early as 1900. The year 1909 saw the production of a Faith Service Regulation Handbook, within which it was noted that trenching was becoming an essential component of defensive tactics for the period, proving necessary for all recruits to become familiar with the practice of spade work and entrenchment. This developed extensively during the period of 1914-18, of course. McGilligan Townland is rich in military heritage, with a number of sites and monuments already recorded on the Northern Ireland Defence Heritage Database. During the 16th and 17th century, military activity centred on the sanctuary of the Foil and its narrows. However, the earliest known cartographic reference to the use of McGilligan for the purpose of military training appears on the third edition Ordnance Survey. It details the 100 yard rifle range and some permanent buildings dispersed across the landscape. The first rifle range established in 1898 was later augmented by two additional 100 yard ranges in 1912 and further expansions then seen in 1914. During this period, encampments were little more than tented accommodation away from the soldiers home garrison. However, permanent facilities did exist, including toilets, ablutions, stores and cookhouses. By the later 19th century, Ireland had many local volunteer corps regularly drilling at locations such as McGilligan. And as the need for British troops intensified following the outbreak of the Second Boer War, the expansion of these camping grounds and range areas became essential. This period saw the conversion of the McGilligan camp into a year-round training facility.
Armstrong huts were erected on the site by early 1915 as part of the war effort to house the increasing number of men volunteering to the war effort and the mounting demands for their training. The camp provided the perfect location for instruction in the art of musketry, fieldwork, entrenching and combined exercises on the vast open ranges. And by early 1915, McGilligan could actually facilitate the billeting of around a thousand men, including auxiliary workforces, training officers and non-commissioned officers. The First World War camp at McGilligan is seen here on the Ordnance Survey 4th edition map to your left, with the extended point camp at McGilligan understood to have been established to supplement the original First World War camp at Lower Doe. Documentation for this part of the camp, however, is pretty limited at this point anyway, with the exception of the Ministry of Defence record plan seen here on the bottom right hand side, which dates to 1943. McGilligan became a noteworthy training hub for the British Army during this early part of the First World War. And after the departure of the Volunteer Army to the Western Front in 1915, the training estate continued as a vast training ground for reserve battalions of the British Army. At the same time, continuing to function as an important central to the approaches of Loch Foy, up to, during and of course beyond the Second World War. So, based on our Phase 1 excavation, um, the evaluation dig, we targeted three areas for investigation, investigation, including Trench 1, which was the possible first war communication practice trench. Trench 2, the backfilled remains of the practice fire trench. And Trench 3, the backfilled remains of a possible 1914-15 S-type fire trench within the tree area. Um, the image on the left here shows you the art of entrenching a candy boy estate in County Down during 1915, where these lads are actually cutting out a communication trench. And then the other image on just to the right of the diagram shows you them digging a fire trench on Salisbury Plain. Trench 1 was aligned approximately east-west along the remains of um, the possible First World War communication trench which could be seen extending eastward in a dog-like fashion, i.e. like in a zigzag manner. Excavation of this trench was originally proposed during Phase 1 evaluations. However, due to the time restraints, it wasn't possible to excavate. Um, basically, COVID kicked in and we had to kind of hurriedly leave site. Communication trenches were the vital channels by which munitions, supplies and soldiers would be transported to the front line. They were constructed perpendicular to the front and also used for the evacuation of casualties and the replacement of troops. Since these trenches were the only safe way into and from the front line. The images at the top of the screen are relevant to um, Kilworth and County Cork actually, um, and just highlight the, um, the location of where you would potentially find and how the layout that you would find of the communication trench within a network of actual trenches, defensive line in this case. A little affected by both animal disturbance and cultivation ridges, which we um, find, the communication trench appears to have remained rel in relatively good condition. Um, the original cut of the feature was clearly apparent, as were the remains of some of the in situ sandbags on both sides of the, the trench. Also identified were the faint flecks of what was believed to be um, XPM wire. Um, what we would commonly know as chicken wire, um, and this was often used to support the sandbag revetting within the trenches. We also think we found the remains of someone's dinner, um, sadly not thought to be First World War related, as found in one of the later deposits, but nonetheless um, an interesting art of, um, discovery uh, to show some of the, the young ones and stuff. Trench 2 was set out over the backfilled remains of what was thought to be the First World War Fire Trench. Our Phase 1 evaluations identified this area for further investigation 
in order to assess the survival of its archaeological features and deposits relative to its construction and use. And Trench 2 was mainly excavated by our community volunteers during the four week period, as most of the photos you will see from here on will highlight. Um, the trench revealed some original breastwork sandbags in situ, acting as both force protection and structural support within the practice trench, as of course would have been the case when constructed on the battlefield. The strata in trench two revealed the continuation of the crenellated fire trench we first that we first located during phase one to be still visible up to a depth of 1.2 metres above the natural sandy subsoil. Um, the former ground surface was directly behind the sandbag revetment at various points on both sides of the trench, which suggests that the relic trench cup was excavated prior to the position of the sandbag revetment, which during use also revetted the subsurface sides of the trench cup. It's worth noting that the water table and winter flooding of the slat floors in this area of McGilligan are adversely high. And for this reason, it appears this trench was constructed in a manner similar to breastwork trenches, commonly seen in Flanders and other areas of ground on the battlefield, of wet ground on the battlefield, I should say. Evidence for this method of trench construction has been previously identified during excavations at the MOD coastal training site of Barry Bodden in Scotland. However, um, our findings here at McGilligan are the first time that these, this has been encountered within the Irish setting, which is a great discovery for the volunteers and the team. Although um, Trench 2 had mostly evaded any substantial landscaping and modification, a number of features and deposits um, we believe are associated to agricultural processing were identified, more specifically cultivation ridges which appear to have been um, created after the initial abandonment of the feature. Um, you can see an aerial photograph here that was taken for us by some very interesting site visitors we had on one of the days, um, which served to highlight this on a broader scale. Again, this phase didn't yield much by way of World War I related artifacts. However, we did um, recover a nice example of a silent screw picket, um, which is an artifact directly associated with trench warfare and the construction of barbed wire defences on the battlefield. Um, it wasn't found in situ and it, it is actually possibly a relic from the battlefield, although nonetheless a nice artefact to recover, um, directly associated of course to trench warfare. Aligned north Trench 3 was aligned northwest southeast across a section of possible frontline trench, again identified during phase one evaluations. Having encountered the face of this feature during phase one, it was proposed that we further investigate it and to try and understand a more detailed examination of the section of the feature. As was the case within Trench 2, there was evidence of substantial sandbag revetment within the S-type trench and the breastwork style construction method was again apparent. A series of dark lenses were encountered and these represent the remains of sandbags located at the north and south sides of the excavation trench and which lined the sides of the practice trench to prevent collapse and slumping. The vestiges of the banding also indicate the movement of sandbags as they began to slump and collapse over time. So the trench was clearly a continuation of the practice trench we'd excavated during phase one, which was our objective to determine. Um, unfortunately, again, no artefacts or dating evidence for the First World War period were recovered from the trenches, from the Trench 3. Of course, we must not forget a key element of this phase of the project was to connect local people, young and old, with the First World War heritage landscape in the area. And by working in collaboration with the MOD, Grace and Andrew from the Benevena team, we successfully facilitated an, an immensely enjoyable community engagement programme. We had 171 pupils and 15 staff from four schools. Um, the schools included Limavady High, Foyle College, School Comkill from Greencastle and Drummer Coase Primary from Limavady. Please excuse my pronunciation. 
um, participating both in excavating and undertaking our mind mapping and artifact activities. In addition to the young people, we also had 15 adult volunteers who participated on the dig, contributing upwards of 48 days of volunteering to the project. All enthusiastically took part in many of the activities. Participants were introduced as far as possible to the technical aspects of field archaeology and to many of the skills which are vital to us as field archaeologists. The project also supported both in Phase 1 and now Phase 2 several QUB students, including Oren, as you see here in the left in a red hoodie, um, who is a third year archaeology undergrad student, um, who's been keen to gain valuable field experience while gathering information for his final year thesis. And this year we also had Astrid with us. Astrid's from Norway and has recently completed her archaeology undergrad with us at QUB, but has now chosen to return to do a placement year within the CCA. So just to uh, round up here, um, importantly, and because of the excavations, a fuller understanding has been gained of the relic trench systems that survive at McGilligan, including the level of preservation and the use of the structures. It has been determined that the Arthrex were indeed First World War practice trenches, um, designed to provide new recruits with essential training in the practice of spade work and entrenchment. Um, the excavated features are important evidence of the past training at McGilligan, and for many that joined us, the project has now afforded a, the that tangible connection to the military landscape and their historic past. The results of the project will inform further archaeological investigations and the ongoing management of the historic elements of the military estate's historic landscape. I'd like to say um, a huge thank you basically to everyone who got involved with the project. Um, most people are actually listed here, um, but there were a lot of people behind the scenes that helped us get to where we were and push forward with the second phase of the project. Um, in particular, obviously, the Ministry of Defence for being such um, an open door and accessible in undertaking the project. And of course, Andrew and Grace from the Benevolent um, team. Um, and obviously, um, no excavation is undertaken without um, transportation, etc. But um, we'd like to thank um, W2 Stevie Scarborough and the 2nd Tanyal Royal Irish Regiment and 38th Brigade for their assistance in manoeuvring tools, etc. and their community engagement team and of course um, the HED licensing team, etc. But anyway, I um, hopefully haven't forgotten anybody and most people are named on here, including all the schools and stuff. Um, if anybody's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And many thanks for listening.